for Dolby Vision. And then we'll, we are looking at a few other topics. Uh, prior to that, a researcher at Sharp Labs developing image processing algorithms for the Sharp TV. Finished my PhD in computer science uh, from University of Southern California. So I'm uh, so going to talk about um, some of the work that we have done in HDR image quality assessment using a machine learning based combination of quality metrics. So high dynamic range and white color gamut they not only allow for a more accurate simulation of aesthetic presentation. So now they have become quite mainstream in the content ecosystem. So through the entire pipeline, right from content creation to distribution through playback, HDR is becoming more and more produced and created by the top studios such as Disney, Universal and so on. It's also distributed by the top companies like Netflix and Amazon and Comcast. And finally, HDR content is consumed on tens of millions of devices manufactured by the top CE companies such as Apple, LG, Samsung, and so on. So consequently, evaluating HDR systems are, is quite important. And we want to measure uh, the quality of HDR content, uh, not just in the traditional sense, but also perceptually what the consumers are actually going to see. And uh, there are different ways to measure image and video quality. So the first way is a subjective assessment where people sit and visually look at content and then they give scores. And in order to get an overall idea of quality, you can then calculate the mean opinion score. The advantages are that this technique is perceptually accurate because a human is actually sitting and giving ratings. The disadvantages are that uh, this technique is not really scalable. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of human effort. And it, it is also quite an expensive process. So the second way is objective assessment where uh, different metrics have been developed for different kinds of applications. So some HDR metrics have been designed such as HDR VDP2, HDR VQM and so on. And a multitude of SDR or standard dynamic range metrics have also been designed. Some, some of them are as simple as PSNR or peak signal to noise ratio. And then there are other popular metrics like SSIM, which is the Structural Similarity Index, IFC, and so on and so forth. And this is where most of the research focus goes into. Uh, the advantages of objective assessment are that it is automated and it is definitely scalable. So it's also low cost because you just develop an algorithm and then you evaluate uh, how well it works. The disadvantages are that um, they may not always be perceptually uh, correct and in most cases they are not as accurate as a human observer. So uh, what we need uh, is a reliable quality metric that can accurately capture human perception of HDR image quality. And our work is inspired from Netflix's VMAF approach, which stands for Video Multi-Method Assessment Fusion, uh, which combines a couple of elementary SDR quality metrics for images. And then for the temporal information, it uses frame differencing. And then uh, machine learning is used to non-linearly combine the scores of these individual metrics in order to predict the final quality. They have subjective data on which they train the model and then validate and evaluate the model. The advantages of uh, this metric are that it leverages the strength of this individual quality metrics. So in our work, uh, what we use is a combination of HDR, SDR, and color difference metrics. 
and for now we only look at still images so we call our metric uh, so, uh, which is essentially a suit of metrics combined together as hdr cqm where cqm stands for combination of quality metrics so this is a brief overview of the proposed method where now we have shown the training phase so in the training phase what we have is a database of uh, reference HDR images and distorted HDR images and they are corresponding to one another and we also have the subjective data for those images. So what we first do is that we compare the reference and the distorted images using a bunch of quality metrics let's say n of them q1 through qn and then we get corresponding scores of each of these metrics s1 through sn the next step is to identify the top metrics to be used and we used a metric selection technique called sffs which stands for sequential floating forward selection to select the top k metrics out of these n metrics and thus we get those corresponding scores s1 through sk and then finally we learn the weights to combine these k scores together from the top k metrics using uh, machine learning techniques and during the testing phase given a reference hdr image and its corresponding distorted hdr image we first compare them using the top k metrics that we had identified during the training phase and then we combine the scores together using the learned weights that we had also obtained during the training step in order to get the final fused score and this is uh, perceptually relevant because we have already tried to map the scores of these techniques to the subjective data using machine learning algorithms so for the metrics uh, we have considered 10 different quality assessment metrics uh, we selected the top six metrics based on a study by Hanhart et al so in their work they had evaluated uh, 35 different objective metrics and they had rated them uh, on the basis of how well they worked on one data set and from those 35 metrics we picked the top six metrics so uh, and then Hanat et al also found out that uh, when they ran the metrics on the data sets uh, they compared it using all three color channels versus using only the luminance channel and they found out that using the luminance channel worked better and that's what even we do in our technique for the str metrics and as i mentioned earlier we used a combination of HDR metrics, SDR metrics, and color difference metrics. So for the HDR metrics, uh, we combine, uh, we use two of them, HDR VDP2, which is the visual difference predictor, and HDR VQM, which is for video quality measure. But in our work, we just run it on still images and there is a way to modify the technique to run it on still images so they have a temporal pooling step that can be ignored so the hdn metrics that have been designed in literature they are typically quite advanced computationally complex and they include ssf or the contrast sensitivity function effects they include masking effects and they also have a spatial pooling step so in this in our work what we do is uh, run the quality hdr quality metrics in the absolute linear luminance values of the hdr images for the sdr metrics uh, like i mentioned earlier we chose them on the basis of work that was done earlier and we picked these six metrics so we picked a uh, multi-scale SSIM, which is the multi-scale structural similarity index, the VIF or the visual information fidelity, FSIM or the feature similarity index, IFC, which is the information fidelity criteria, 
FSITM, which is the fe feature similarity index for tone mapped images, and uh, UQI, which is the universal image quality index. So the first four of these, um, they were on the basis of work by Hannah et al. And then we found out in literature that there were two more techniques that do a decent job on HDR images. And then we included them in our work as well. And to run the STR metrics, what we did is that we com converted the linear range of the HDR images to the PQ, which is the Perceptual Quantizer ST2084 domain. And then we computed the metrics on only the luminance channel. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, this was mainly motivated by Hanhart et al's work that showed that working on luminance channel was actually better than working on all three color channels. And then in order to uh, find out color differences, we used uh, two different color difference metrics. The first one is Delta E 2000 and the second one is Delta E ITP. So Delta E 2000, uh, it started with uh, the Euclidean distance in C-Lab, but was then improved over time by modifying the L star, A star and B star vectors, um, as opposed to redesigning the base space, which is essentially C-Lab. And Delta E ITP is a Euclidean distance uh, in perceptual space that was done after minor rescaling of the ICTCP coding space. So um, ICTCP is a coding color representation where coding refers to the base plan quantization. It essentially starts from XYZ and goes into LMS cone fundamental space. It uses a standardized Hunt pointer Estevez transformation. It includes not only the LMS responses, but also the optical effects that precede them like the eyeball optics, macular pigment in retina, and so on. Um, so ICTCP was modified for hue linearity data, and it uses the SIMT2084 PQ curve. And ICTCP color space has also been standardized in ITUR BT2100. So here is a plot that shows, compares essentially Delta EITP and Delta E2000. And on the x-axis, we have five different luminance ranges, both white gamut and reduced saturation colors. And on the y-axis, we have the color differences. So there are some advantages that are not shown here, which include constant luminance, improved hue linearity, and then it avoids the wrong one keys color adaptation and so on. So the white point that was used for Delta E2000 uh, is 100 nits. That is common practice for SDR video. For ITU HDR 200 would be used. So, uh, so here is a horizontal line along the value of one. In black, you can see the prediction using Delta E2000. And in red, you can see the prediction using Delta E ITP. A value that is more than one means that the metric believes you could actually see a difference when in reality you could barely see one, which is essentially overestimating the human visual system. And a value which is less than one or below one means that the metric believes you cannot see a difference when in reality you could barely just see one, so which is essentially underestimating the uh, human visual system. So what we want is typically values around one. And you can see that overall uh, Delta E ITP, which is the red plot, is closer to the value of one as compared to Delta E 2000. So these are the different metrics that we have considered in our work so far. So to summarize, uh, we have considered uh, 10 different quality metrics. The first two are the HDR metrics. The next six are the SDR metrics, where uh, this prefix of uh, Q stands for the PQ curve being applied to the linear values, and a prefix of Y, oh sorry, the suffix PQ. And for Y means that it's done on the intensity channel. And then uh, we have two different color difference metrics that we have considered.
So now once we have these different color difference metrics, we want to combine them. And in order to do that, uh, we tried out various different machine learning algorithms to see what works the best. So the first one that we tried out is linear regression, which essentially just tries to fit a straight line through the data. The second technique that we tried out is support vector machine regression which essentially tries to find an optimal hyperplane such that the margin between the points is maximum. It tries to maximize the margin that is present here. And we use a radial basis function as a kernel in our work for the best performance. We also tried out uh, random trees, which is essentially decision trees, and you build a regression model out of it. We also tried out a random forest regression, which uses a large collection of decision trees based on random selection of samples and a random selection of parameters. We also tried out a multi-layer perceptron, which is a neural network technique, which is not deep, which is kind of the trend nowadays. Uh, we used a shallow technique that has just three hidden layers. And for the activation function at the end, we use a sigmoid function. And then we also tried out um, this re relatively newer technique called gradient boosted regression tree or GBRT, which uses an ensemble of decision trees that is built in a stage-wise fashion, one after the other, as is done in boosting methods. And it allows for optimization using a differentiable loss function. So, uh, so we tried out all these techniques on one particular database to see which one worked better. And in order to evaluate that, uh, we used uh, three different techniques. Uh, the first one is Pearson Linear Correlation Coefficient, PLCC, which is used to measure prediction accuracy. We also use the Spearman Rank Order Correlation Coefficient or SROCC, which is used for uh, measuring prediction monotonicity. And then we finally used RMSE for prediction consistency. And in one of the databases that we tried out, here are the scores for um, each of the machine learning techniques that we tried out, which is shown in the rows over here. And in the columns, we have mentioned the PLCC, SROCC, and the RMSE values. Um, higher values of PLCC and SROCC is better, and lower values of RMSE is better. And then we found out that uh, support vector machine actually results in the best performance, which is also not quite surprising because we found out that uh, even Netflix's VMAF technique, they also use uh, the support vector machine to combine the metrics. And so we found some sort of consistency in that respect. So now the next step uh, is, so we know the quality metrics that we want to use. We know how we want to fuse them. Now, the part that's remaining is how would we like to combine the quality metrics? And for that, uh, we would like to find the right combination of metrics. So a knife technique is to just combine all of the metrics, uh, but we want to be slightly smarter with that. So in order to do that, uh, like I briefly mentioned earlier, we used uh, the sequential floating forward selection technique. So what, what this technique does is that it starts from an empty set of metrics. And as and when you keep on adding a metric, this technique performs backward steps, essentially trying to remove metrics as long as the objective function increases. Um, so which is, which is not so typical in literature because they typically have a greedy approach where they just keep adding metrics and they don't really account for all possible combinations that could be done. But this is a smarter way to do that without having higher complexity. And the advantage of choosing this technique is that it has backtracking capabilities. So here is a more detailed uh, description of that. So essentially what step one states is that we start from an empty step, empty set of metrics. And step what step two states is that we select the best possible metric from the pool of remaining metrics in a greedy manner. And then we update uh, the counter 
and we update our set accordingly, the set of metrics that we want to use. Step three states that from amongst the pool of the metrics that we have selected, which is YK, we find the worst metric. And step four states that if the value of the objective function increases by removing the worst metric, then we remove it and we do that process iteratively. And if not, we go back to step two, where we once again select the best metric uh, in a greedy manner. So the features that are mentioned over here are essentially the metrics that we want to use. And uh, here are the results on one of the databases that we had considered. So the metrics uh, selected using SFFS, which is the sequential floating forward selection, is shown in this table. And uh, so the metrics over here are just the index of that metric and the key to that index is present on the table on the right. So we essentially refer to the metrics by their indices. And uh, as you can see here, Q2 corresponds to HDR VQM and Q1 corresponds to HDR VDP2. So what we find found out is that if we use as few as two metrics, um, it results in improved performance over state of the art, um, which is uh, just adding metrics is helpful. And as and when we keep on adding more metrics, we found out that uh, we improved the performance, the correlation increased from 0.9664 all the way to 0.9696. And we get the best performance when we use seven metrics. However, if we use all the metrics that we have, then the performance kind of drops. So we, the performance peaks when we use a certain number of metrics and after that the performance drops. So this could happen either due to the curse of dimensionality or due to increased data requirement for better estimates because we have a fixed number of images and we are applying the machine learning technique to add more metrics to the same data set. So there could also be more sources of error creeping in when more metrics are present. But what this states is that naively combining all the best metrics in the world will not be helpful. We would have to be smart about how we want to combine these metrics. So now we have uh, identified all the pieces of the puzzle. So we will take select few metrics that we want we would want to identify the metrics that we want to select from those pool. And then we have a way to combine those metrics and uh, use that to, that's essentially the model that we have. And in order to evaluate the model, uh, we tried it out on a bunch of databases which are publicly available. Um, essentially, we tried it out on the five databases which are shown here in the columns. So databases one through five. So the first three databases uh, uh, consisted of uh, images. So these are well calibrated databases. So the observers have given us information about on what kind of monitors were they trained on, the viewing distances and so on. So the first three databases, the experiments were conducted on a SIM2 monitor, which had a Rec 709 color gamut. And the monitor had a black level of 0 0.01 nits and it went as high as 4000 nits. And the last two databases that we considered was on a BVMX 300, which had a wider color gamut, a 2020 gamut, and it went darker. So it had a black level of 0 0.001 nits, but it wasn't also as bright. So the peak brightness was 1000 nits. And then we tried out different uh, distortions. So these databases have different distortions. Uh, the first database has JPEG XT compression artifacts. Um, so they have 20 images and they have 240 distorted images. So for each of these 20 images, they have 12 different type of distortions that were obtained by using four different bit rates at three different profiles. So resulting in 12 distortions. The second database that we considered had three different types of distortions, JPEG, JPEG XT, and JPEG 2000. It had uh, 10 images, and then it had 10 distortions for each of those images, 
resulting in 100 distorted images. The third database that we considered also had JPEG artifacts and used in backward compatible coding. It also had 10 test images, source images, and it had 14 different distortions for each of those 10 images. So essentially, it had uh, seven bit rates of JPEG at two different optimization criteria. And the first three databases, they mostly had distortions in the luminance channel, not in the color channel, as opposed to the last two databases, which had distortions in the color channels as well. So on the fourth database, um, it had uh, three different types of distortions. The first one is HEVC distortion. Then they had Gaussian noise applied on all three color channels and they had some gamut mismatch. So essentially what that was is that they considered REC 709 images and assumed that it was in a REC 2020 container and then that showed color mismatch. And likewise, they did vice versa. Assume that REC 2020 images were REC 709 resulting in a completely different look. And they had eight different test images and they had 12 distortions for each of those eight images resulting in 96 different types of distorted images which were essentially obtained using four different uh, QP values and the HEVC had some of them with chroma optimization some of them without chroma optimization and then um, there were Gaussian noise applied on chroma. And the last database that we considered also had uh, HEVC distortions based on baseband quantization. Once again, uh, they had eight uh, source images, which is the reference images. And then they had 12 different distortions for each of those eight images. And those were obtained by using four different QP values at three different criteria. And uh, so the criteria are mentioned here. Uh, we, will, we can skip the details of that. So essentially it resulted in some chroma artifacts. Now let's take a look at some of the sample images for each of the data sets. So here, uh, these are sample images from database one. These are some of the sample images from uh, database two. Some sample images from database three images from database 4. You can find that some of the reference images are similar like this lady over here. I think she's present in some MPEG data sets and uh, they apply different kinds of distortions to those. And then the fifth database is present here on the bottom, far bottom right. And let's take a look at some of these distortions and I hope that they come across well through blue jeans, if not, uh, uh, I can send the slide deck later if need be. So here is an example of the original image from the first database. And let's see. And here is the distorted image. And I will toggle between the two. And you can see that there are some pretty severe distortions in the skies, in the walls over here. I hope they are getting across, if not, just trust me on that. And there are some distortions in the floor as well. Likewise, uh, here is a sample image from the second database, which is the original image. And here is the distorted image. And you can see that there are pretty severe branding, banding artifacts in the sky region of the image. And here is an example of image from the third database, which is the original image. And here is the distorted image. Once again, you can see that there are some pretty severe distortions in the sky. I hope it's coming across. Uh, yes, yes, we can, uh, we can see the distortions. That's good. Okay, great. And um, here are some original images from database four. And these are the type of distortions that they have. So the leftmost image has, I'm toggling between the two. The leftmost images have Gaussian noise on all three color channels. The center image has HEVC compression artifacts 
uh, that is manifested as some blocking artifacts that you can see here. And on the right, uh, it is an example of gamut mismatch uh, where you can see that uh, the distorted image has a much saturated look as compared to the original image. And here is an example from the fifth database, so which is the original image. And here is a distorted image. And I'm toggling between the two. And you can see that there are some blocky artifacts present here in the water as well as in some of these smoke that's coming out. So these are the kind of some variety of distortions that are present uh, in these databases. So uh, in order to evaluate them, uh, we compare the mean opinion score that is obtained from the subjective study with the predicted mean opinion scores using these techniques. And then once we have that prediction, we fit a monotonic logistic function to fit this objective prediction to the subjective scores. So this is a pretty standard technique in the uh, quality assessment community where the logistic functions are meant to account for complex cognitive effects. It anchors details of the subjective experiment design and memory effects. And there are these four parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, that are then, op then it's optimized to get the best uh, predicted curve based on your score. And to evaluate the techniques, uh, we used four different criteria. I talked about the first three. And the last one is the outlier ratio, which is essentially trying to find out how many data points are outliers. So the first assessment that we did was to find out if our choice of machine learning technique actually made sense across all the databases. So here on the right, we have the five different databases. So now I have highlighted database one, then database two, three, four, and five. And the call and the rows are uh, the each of the machine learning techniques that we tried out. And the columns are the three different evaluation criteria that I had talked about, talk, uh, that I've mentioned earlier. The Pearson coefficient, the Spearman, and the RMAC. We have skipped the outlier because the trends are quite similar. And we found out that uh, support vector machine actually performs the best on four out of five databases. Uh, it has a higher PLCC and SROCC and typically lower RMSE. On one of the databases, the gradient boosted regression tree performed the best. And But on an average, we found support vector machine to be the best. And we used that as our uh, machine learning technique to fuse all of these different metrics. Uh, the next evaluation that we did is trying to find out the best combination of metrics for each of these databases. So over here, we have the table where the rows are the different databases. And we have two different columns. The first column is the best combination of metrics. And the second column is how many metrics were needed to get the best performance. And uh, as I had mentioned earlier, we identify these metrics using these indices and the key to that index is present here on the right. And um, as you can see here, for each of these databases, uh, we found out that the best combination was obtained using a different number of metrics and potentially a different combination of metrics. Uh, so that's the first point that in order to get the best performance, we found out that a different combination worked uh, better. What's interesting is that for databases that consisted of color artifacts, uh, Delta E ITP was automatically chosen as one of the top metrics. Now note that Delta E ITP and Delta E 2000 were the only two metrics that accounted for color distortions. The other metrics were used on only the luminance channel and somehow the machine learning technique was able to identify that uh, color difference metric is actually helpful to identify color artifacts. And this was with, without any manual intervention. And what we also found out is that one of the HDR metrics 
is always amongst the top three metrics. So you can also note that the HDR metrics were also quite complex and it had um, it was much more well developed than the SDR metrics that were there and it was also identified as one of the best performing metrics in um, in all the databases but there was a different combination like sometimes HDR VQM was found to be the top performing and sometimes HDR VDP2 but it's present in the top three and here are the results on um, all the databases I'll go through them one by one so the first two, so this is the result on the first database. The first two rows show the result on uh, using the HDR metrics. The rows shown in orange show the results using uh, SDR metrics. And then in magenta, we have the results using the color difference metrics. And then we have a bunch of other metrics here below. So the metrics shown here, if you can see my mouse, these two metrics are based on other machine learning techniques. One of them is based on a deep neural network. Um, the other is based on uh, uh, another machine learning technique. And the columns over here are the evaluation criteria. Like I mentioned earlier, the Pearson coefficient, SROCC, RMSE is the root mean squared, and OR is the outlier ratio. Um, higher values of PLCC and SROCC is better, and lower values of RMSE and R outlier ratio is better. And what we found out is that um, our metrics HDR CQM using just two metrics outperformed any of the existing metrics. So amongst the existing metrics, we found out uh, that HDR VQM performed the best and uh, the best performance that we we obtained was using seven metrics, which resulted in a correlation of 0.97 as compared to the existing met best metric, which resulted in a correlation of 0.959. So similarly on uh, database two, uh, we, oh, one more thing over here that we found out is that the best performing SDR metric, which is MSSSIM, if you look at uh, these six rows, it has a correlation of 0.9323. And that was obtained by applying the MS SSIM technique in the PQ domain on the luminance channel. But what we also tried is applying this MS SSIM technique on just the linear values. And we found out that it resulted in a significantly lower correlation of 0.86 as opposed to 0.93 when you apply on the PQ domain. So adding more intelligence to the uh, to the signal essentially results in better performance when you apply an existing metric. On database two, uh, we have similar observations. Um, so we have the best performing existing metric having a score of uh, Pearson score of 0 0.936 and um, the best performance using R metric results in a score of 0 0.965. And uh, we have similar observations for the SDR as well. So VIF performed the best in PQ domain resulted in a correlation of 0.923. And if you just applied it on the linear values, it resulted in a correlation of just 0.72. Uh, these are the results on the third database. Um, so once again, uh, the best performing metric, uh, existing metric is TDML which resulted in a correlation of 0 0.923, whereas uh, the best metric using uh, R method resulted in a correlation of 0 0.977. Uh, note that we did not use a TDML or CNN IQA in our, uh, in our combination, but that's the beauty of our technique that you can literally use any metric that you want. You can swap things in and out. Um, here are the results on the fourth database. So as you can see here, um, it, it had, uh, so this database was quite varied. It had three different types of chroma artifacts and stuff. Um, and then each, so the correlation is not as high as compared to the other databases. So over here, uh, using HDR VDP2 had a correlation of 0 0.856. 
and uh, that was the best and using our technique uh, we obtained a correlation of 0.89 and uh, finally uh, on the fifth database uh, we found out that the best performing metric was in fact an SDR metric uh, which is FSIM or the feature similarity index which had the correlation of uh, 0.9 as opposed to uh, our metric which combined seven different metrics resulting in a correlation of 0.95. So in order to truly know if these metrics are actually working or not, uh, we tested them for statistical significance. So in order to do that, uh, we calculated the Fisher Z transform and then performed the Z test to test for statistical significance. And here are the results on database one. So over here, uh, we have sorted the metrics by uh, the performance essentially we consider just the Pearson values but the trends are pretty similar across the other evaluation criteria as well and as you can see here they are sorted by the performance of each of these metrics and then you can see a vertical bar to the right so what the vertical bar means is that those metrics are statistically equivalent and for metrics that don't have a vertical bar that's statistically different and if it's higher then it's statistically better and as you can see here, HDR-CQM is statistically significantly different and better than existing metrics. And HDR-VQM and HDR-VDP2, they are statistically equivalent to one another. And you can see similar observations across the other metrics. Uh, likewise, on database 2 as well, we found out that HDR-CQM resulted in statistically significantly better performance than the existing metrics. Uh, on database three as well, we found out that our technique is once again statistically significantly better than the existing metrics. On database four, surprisingly, uh, we found out that uh, our metric is statistically equivalent to three other metrics. And uh, that could be attributed due to the fact that none of them are performing as well. And for our technique, especially, it only has a small set of 96 images that were used. And uh, so that's not enough data to train a machine learning model. And however, on database five, which also had just 96 images, we found out that we were able to achieve uh, statistically significantly better results than any of the existing methods. So then we did some additional analysis to understand how many metrics do we actually need to make our technique statistically significantly better. And so over here, the rows state the different uh, databases that we have. And the first column over here uh, states the number of metrics that were used for the best performance. And the second column stated the number of metrics that were needed to make our technique statistically significantly better than existing metrics. And we found out that for database one, we need four, on database two, we need three, on database three, we just need four again. Database four, we were already equivalent, so we could not be better. And on database five, we need five images. And then the final test that we did was to do some cross database validation. So what we do is that we train our model on all images of one database and test it on a different database. And we use uh, just four metrics, the best combination for each database in order to do that. And here are the results. So essentially for database one, the rows indicate that uh, it was trained using the best combination of metrics using uh, best combination of four metrics for that particular database, but then it was tested on a completely different database which could have completely different artifacts and those are the different rows and the last row is the best existing performance using a metric that has worked on just that database and we found that on an average uh, it's quite flexible so on database two the performance was similar whereas on, if we use the metrics that were trained on the other databases using the best combination for that database then it resulted in uh, improvement over uh, what is state of the art. So this just extends uh, the metric to other data sets 
and shows the robustness of our technique. So let's take a look at some of the pros and cons of our method. Uh, the advantages are that this is an extremely flexible framework and technically we can include any metric for improved performance. Uh, it leverages the strength of the quality metrics while getting rid of the weaknesses. Um, it's a flexible metric and the framework can be customized for any type of content or artifacts. So you could swap in and out metrics. Uh, the disadvantages of our method are that the performance is constrained by the training data. As you can see, it's a machine learning technique and it can only be as good as the training data is. And so that's a constraint. And the complexity is higher since it involves computing multiple methods, but it's not as high as naively just combining all the metrics that you want to. It's smarter, so it doesn't combine everything, but just a subset of them. So to conclude, uh, we introduced a new HDR quality measure that combines multiple high dynamic range, standard dynamic range, and color difference quality metrics for improved HDR quality assessment. We used uh, the non-greedy sequential floating forward selection technique for metric selection. We found out that naively combining all metrics does not result in optimal performance. Uh, in order to fuse the metrics together, we found out that using support vector machine regression works better than other machine learning techniques that we tried. We also did a lot of extensive statistical analysis to, found, to find out that uh, our technique is statistically significantly better than existing metrics. And in order to show the generality and robustness, we did cross database validation where we trained on one database and tested it on a completely different database and showed that that still works. And for future work, uh, we would like to extend the metric to videos. So right now it just works on still images. So we want to incorporate some temporal aspects to it. We would also like to explore the performance for other distortions. I briefly talked about the distortions on which we tested because, uh, and those were mostly compression artifacts and some gamut mismatch and compression artifacts in chroma channels as well. But then there are other types of distortions as well that include contrast, shadow detail, highlights, and also include temporal artifacts like flicker, motion drag, line crawl, and such. And we want to see how well we can work there. And then finally, uh, we would like to improve the computational cost of our method. It's currently a linear combination of all the metrics, but we want to see if something can be uh, if there are some common functionality between the metrics and that can be just computed once and not done multiple times. But that's one more thing that we'd like to do. And uh, with that, I conclude my talk. And I guess uh, we can open up the session for questions. Bravo, there you go. thank you. Yes, thank you. That's, yeah. a, that's a remote uh, applause. <laughs> I'll ask a Go really ahead. vague one first. Uh, um, you you sh did a lot of work showing some cross validation, but I also recall the one comment that went by that said that in one comparison you only had ninety six images to work with, which isn't enough. As much as well, as much as well, you you use the words I believe isn't enough for machine learning, and so I'm wondering how you're reconciling those two things and what what you might do to get more imagery or why you didn't have more imagery available? So firstly, it's very hard to find well calibrated HDR data sets. So all the results that we have shown are on publicly available data sets and that's all we could find. And uh, so internally, uh, we are conducting subjective tests to get more data. And data is all you need for machine learning techniques to work better. I mean, it needs to be smart data and just not naive. And um, so, yeah, so that's one way to reconcile the fact that, okay, 96 images for one database is not enough, but let's try and gather more data. So um, uh, I, I had a question. Um, uh, final images, reconstruct image, you weren't reconstructing uh, from in an HDR sense, is that correct? 
big difference uh, for your analysis that they have to be from HDR, they could be from single exposures, and could you not apply them to other databases? Because you're working with final images, am I correct? Yeah, we totally can. Like the Netflix study that they have done, that's mm -hmm. primarily on SDR images. Okay. It works. And it's an open source code widely used by communities all <clears throat> over the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so, yes, I mean, it's just a matter of what your training data is and what you want to do with it. Sure. And if there is some correlation there, then sure. That that makes sense. So, the, I mean, a key difference in looking at these was, I think you have a greater than 8 bits or greater than 24 bits, of course, um, because it's HDR and it's generated that way. Am I right? Yes. Between those and SDR. And yeah. an, another question, and this was regarding um, the databases. Um, when I looked into this, it was a few years ago, but at that time, um, many of the databases, as you said, they're expensive to... to um, to develop published and they're shared. However, they tend to represent uh, the imaging results from several years earlier. A as an example, I'm looking at some of your examples. I had looked at this and not, not referring to your study. I found that um, what was being used when I looked at images did not seem realistic at that time. And that would have been about 2016, 17. Do, do you bump into that in looking at the artifacts? That they're yes. basically of poorer quality than you would actually be, you know, using today. Some of these databases, they do have extreme artifacts. Mm. And so essentially what you have is you have a pretty wide range of signal. Like mm -hmm. you have really good quality and really extreme. The other thing to consider is that having poor quality is also kind of becoming the norm in some sense. And companies like Netflix are trying to deliver their content to the country having the poorest bandwidth in internet and yes, they could true. get a pretty bad quality of images and we have been talking to them and their bitrate goes quite low mm -hmm. and so uh, yes from a traditional sense we would not like such images but it seems as if it's a pretty uh, valid use case. So on the other hand, Dolby, we typically look at images that are of good quality and it doesn't really, yeah. while talking to Netflix, it seems a genuine problem to include poorer quality images as well. Yeah, I, I was thinking of that too. Um, I, w I was thinking, oh yes, this is this looks like what you'd see in streaming or, you know, <laughs> occasionally or all the time. Uh, and then I was re reminding that the talk is about HDR and I'm thinking with your Dolby images, they're going to be the the image the the variation will be more subtle um so that's a that's a good point yes yeah we are we are trying yeah. to collect data on videos actually we have collected some data but we have not really evaluated them mm -hmm. okay very good thank you thanks for having me it's been an honor to talk to this audience so, and yes i will when i get it i thank you okay. thank okay. you okay. all right all right thank all right. you very much right. good evening yeah. all Sure. Thank you. Good night okay. to you. All right. Bye.